Hi, I'm Marisol Diaz, Communications and Digital Manager here at SAC. Thank you for joining us for another edition of 3 O'Clock with SAC. Give me a second while I welcome our Spanish-speaking residents. Buenas tardes, gracias por estar con nosotros hoy en 3 en punto con SAC. Si quieren acceso al programa en español, favor de marcar el número que aparece en la pantalla que es 646-749-3122. Y la contraseña para entrar es 779-328-221. And just as a reminder, you can access these past episodes here on Facebook in our video section and on YouTube. And now I will go ahead and turn it over to our moderator of the day, and she and will she introduce won. today's topic. Hello, everyone. My name is Marlene Zaran, and I am the COVID project coordinator and forum coordinator for the Southside Organizing Center. Welcome to Three O'Clock with SOC um, today. And uh, I will uh, just go ahead and say that um, staff for SOC and all of our platforms are available to you virtually at all times. Uh, you can contact us at 414-672-8090. You can also reach us at our email, uh, which is SOC, S-O-C, at SOCMilwaukee.org. Or you can visit our website, which is www.SOCMilwaukee.org. Um, it would be really helpful if uh, the viewers of our SOC forum for today could complete our SOC survey. So our SOC survey gives us feedback on how we're doing and what other topics or suggestions you have for us for the forum. Anything that is of your interest that you would like to hear about, you can definitely complete the survey and um, we will try to include that in our next upcoming segments. So I just wanna let everyone know that um, I'm currently at home and I'm working from my living room uh, which is why I'm not wearing a mask right now. Um, so um, everybody from SOC is essentially working virtually and we are working from home. So um, if you do see individuals wearing their mask when they're on our segment, it's probably because they are working from their work facility. Um, so if everybody could say hello and hi, um, that would be amazing. We'd like to know who is here today and who is um, listening in. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions shared today do not necessarily reflect those of SOC. Um, and I would like to go ahead and introduce um, our topic of the week. So our topic of the week for this week is new generation of organizers. And a quick update for you guys is that we're going to reach our 100th episode, August 25th. And we're actually having a Zoom celebration for that um, on August 25th. And we'll get more details for you all as the days um, move forward. Uh, for this week, Friday, tomorrow, we have Dakota Hall, which is the Executive Director of Leaders Igniting Transformation, or LIT. Um, next week's theme, we're starting something new. Uh, we're starting a new format for our schedule within each day. So for Mondays, we're having a civic day. Uh, Tuesdays, we're having youth day. So that means all of the youth from our uh, gold program and other youth programs will be contributing together with our youth coordinator, Taylor, and she's going to be uh, moderating that day with lots of great activities and the youth will be essentially running the whole entire production day. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, Wednesday is, the sp is our Spanish days, and that's going to be moderated by Tammy Rivera, our executive director. And Thursday, we're having a COVID-19 segment, so you'll see me all day Thursday. And um, Friday is uh, essentially organizing leadership and community development. Uh, so for our guest today, we have Devin Anderson from 
the African American Round Table. And the critical topic that he's going to be talking about today is a uh, law enforcement defunding campaign of liberate Milwaukee. So we're just going to go ahead and have that come on. So now I'd like to welcome our guest for the day, Devin Anderson from the African American Roundtable. And I just want to share a little bit about the collaborative work that we've done so far with their leadership. And so you've heard me talk about the what is now the Community Collaborative Commission, the CCC. Um, and you've heard me say that our great leader uh, to launch that initiative was Marquesa Tucker. And Marquesa Tucker is the director of the African American Roundtable. And so her and I and Fred Royal, which we've had on the program as well, have dug in for several years now on the CCC. And I'm just so proud of her leadership and her diligence and her vision and her team. And so we're, that's why we're so excited that uh, Devin Anderson is with us today. Welcome, Devin. Hola. Hey, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, obviously. And yeah, my name is Devin Anderson. I'm the lead organizer with the African American Roundtable. So yeah, Marquesa is our uh, fearless leader. And yes, I think yes. like, <laughs> yeah, and I think Tammy really gave a good intro into how Marquesa got started in the work. And I think one of the things we've learned over the last few years is, is this evolution of the work. I think like, and I'll get into it now, but I think like right now sure. what we're seeing is this, is this moment. We've seen in Milwaukee in particular, people take the street for the last 70 days. We've seen a, lash, a national movement, people take the street in all 50 states and globally with the demand, a demand to defund the police and a demand to radically change the way in which our communities are policed. And I think that demand is super um, important and urgent and for this moment, because what we know is our communities like right, let's let's name it black and brown yeah. communities are <laughs> over policed. Yeah. We know our community in Milwaukee, 45% of the budget goes to the police. And what we're saying is we're setting forth the most positive vision of a community can be. We're saying we're setting forth a community where where folks, everybody's needs are met, where folks have access to affordable quality housing, where folks have access to jobs and opportunity, where our young people have access to programming, right? Where folks are, we're setting forth a vision where folks are not worried about getting um, evicted, um, right? We're living through a pandemic and we know the next phase of this pandemic is gonna be evictions of our people because- It's already it's, happening. Already it's happening. already rolling. And it will continue to happen because we, we have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And the state's response to this pandemic has not been strong enough, has not been effective enough, and has not centered us enough. So what we're saying is let's redefine our relationship as community, let's redefine our relationship with police and policing, and let's begin to take money from that institution that in many ways has not kept us safe, that in many ways have harmed us, that have, that have taken our families and separated our families, right? And let's put those money into programs, programs that will meet our needs and help us build forth the community. I'll say one more thing and I'll pass it back to you, Tammy, to, sure, sure. to continue to guide us. When, I think sometimes when people think like, when, when they hear the defund demand, they think um, it's a negative demand. It's just about taking stuff away from people. But what we're saying is we can redefine and come up with things that keep us safe as a community. We don't need always police on every corner to, to tell us how to keep us safe. And what we're saying is we're setting forth the most positive vision 
right? I think everybody's dream world is a world where there's no crime and where we don't need police. And that's the conversation we're starting to have. And I think often the message is co-opted, the message isn't clearly set forth, but we're saying it is possible and we're saying we're already doing some of this work. I'll give one example of the ways in which we're already helping and supporting ourselves. And I guarantee all the viewers have similar experiences. How many, like, imagine how many people have, um, when they've seen a fight breaking out between young people in their corner, they've intervened and broken up themselves. That's setting forth the vision of community keeping each other safe, community protecting each other. That's part of our vision. How many people, I remember when I was in college, I was an RA and some really crazy stuff broke out on our floor. And it ended like, and it ended, <laughs> and it ended widely. But the calling the police never, never entered my mind because we, I knew I knew these people, I had relationship with, with these people and I was in a relationship with these people and we can work this out without intervening. That's part of the conversation we're trying to have when we're leading here. I really appreciate you sharing that because defunding some groups in the community, some individuals to get as only negative. And obviously because of the response from the police department, they're taking it negative. Because it doesn't feel good when you've depended on some types of resources to do your vision. What was missing, and the, 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 our viewers have heard me say is, this has to be a co-created community. If, if you just go to the future with your lens of law enforcement from history of what it's been used for, this you miss out on all the rest of the perspectives that really solve crimes that also create public safety. I, I give this example all the time. I live across the street from a uh, 24-hour Walgreens. Now, when Walgreens calls to the police and says there's stuff happening, that's one perspective, their own perspective, right? The aldermen get complaints from the neighborhoods. That's a piece of data. Tammy lives across the street and she sees everything that happens all the time and she goes there. Those are all, any one of those is not a complete picture. But together, we're going to make that Walgreens safer for everybody. And so that's why I like how you explain to people, it means, defunding means really funding the best safety plans. Not defunding, it's funding the best safety plans. So I appreciate that you said that. And that's a key piece of the work, folks, that the African American Roundtable is doing. I'm really appreciating, Devin, the work that you guys are doing. Uh, about visualizing the city budget so people yeah. get it um, and where the money's going and giving the community an invitation to decide how that money's going to be used. And we're starting a layer of that. So I'll have my staff connect with you guys because you're doing such a great job uh, to help the community have choices of how they want to use their taxes is super important. Um, the other piece that I heard you say that I want to lift up is Let's invest on preventing problems yes. and invest in creating healthy communities because in the end, we all want to be safe. Um, so that's a huge part of the work that you do. Um, Devin, talk about your role there. So uh, describe it a little bit and then describe what's your, the scope in your portfolio. Yeah, the scope in my portfolio is like <laughs> always changing, but the big piece of the work I do right now is around like so put put what I what I laid out is bringing people in to really explain their vision, right? It's one thing to have this demand; it's another thing to dig into that demand as I'm doing and explain to folks like our vision of the community and give folks space to envision what they want their community to look like. Because, right, I think I'm a smart person, and hopefully, Tammy, you agree I'm a smart person. Yes, you are. <laughs> but it's not up to me, me alone, to decide what we want our community to look like. It's not up to me alone to do that visioning. So it's bringing folks in um, to do that. Really, a lot of my time right now is bringing folks in and educating on one thing we did earlier this summer. We did a defund police study group where it was a four-week um, training series and we walked through like all the steps and like walked through definitions and gave alternatives to what we see, gave folks space to vision, which was really successful and really fun. But really um, another big piece of my work too is like talking about voting and, and like really placing voting um, 
voting, voting in this in this larger movement. One of the things I say is we know voting alone won't get us free. We know voting alone as a tactic is not enough. And so, but it's important. It's extraordinarily important because the people, right, that the people who decide the budget are people we vote, vote for. And so if we want our tables represented, I mean, if we want our issues represented at the table, we need to go out and vote um, and vote in every election, but we can't stop just with that, that action of voting. We need to be following up with these folks. We need to be pushing these folks. We need to be holding these folks accountable. And so that's a big part is like- Year round civic engagement, everyday civic engagement. Yeah, and to allow folks to, to allow folks the tools to engage with their elected officials after they vote for it. Sometimes people think voting, I voted for this person and now they're gonna do everything I said uh, they said they were going to do. And that's not the case. And I think that's why sometimes people get like disillusioned is because like sometimes and like some people talk about voting as, as the, the, as the ticket. And we have to talk about voting paired with, it always has to be paired with other tactics, voting paired with a follow-up meeting, voting paired with emails, voting paired with us taking the streets, voting paired with us doing so many of the things that we know um, keep us safe and will and we'll provide the community we, we want to see. Great stuff. Um, we just had uh, the primary, and so we hope that folks uh, participated in that and that um, they were uh, satisfied with the results. and and that they're geared up now for the November election, which is a critical election. Uh, Devin, let's talk, uh, let's shift gears. So we've talked about your key issue, uh, uh, law enforcement um, defunding or funding safety, right? Like, yeah. um, a little bit about civic engagement year round. Let's, uh, let's talk about the new generation of organizers. So, okay. I have the folks who went before me, which are the traditional civil rights leaders, like our legacy, right, giants. I'm so appreciative of those folks um, who led the civil rights movement, the Latino rights movement, the bilingual, the farm worker movement, that's it, that affects our constituency. And then my generation, we tackled welfare reform, um, defunding of schools, the charter choice movement, um, you know, like all those battles. And now uh, we have a generation of like 30 and 40 year olds and teens and 20s. So tell me from your generational perspective, what are you, what are the things you would like our generation or older to understand about organizing for you all? Yeah, I, I think one of the things like, um, the round table we talk about and we're trying to build out is, is this intergenerational space. And I think like one of the things is like, like I study movement and I look back at like the, the past generations and there's so much to learn from them. Um, and then like, we don't want that to be lost at all. Like I'm, I'm just like rereading like Angela Davis and John Lewis who just recently passed. And I'm, I'm looking back to that and rereading old school black feminists. Um, and I think like one of the things that like our generation or like at least we're trying to do is to really to really build off of some of that great work and continue to push forward um, visions, even more radical visions of, off that great work. I think like one of the things um, the Kambahi River Collective, old school black feminists from the 1970s group of activists and organizers, they said, um, until like all people, all black people are free, um, none of us are free. And I think like one of the things we're like trying to use that language and build off of that. And, like that's why we're taking on institutions that in, in in the past like there's always been people talking about defunding, but I think we're like using their language and it's more of us now to do that. I think another thing we're trying to do is 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 queerize if that makes sense the politics and and be more inclusive of of all folks on all the spectrums. Like I think sometimes we think of black folks and even brown folks as monolithic, but we know within mm -hmm. our communities, there's a spectrum of people that include LGBTQ folks. And we're trying to bring them in and say like, right, we have to be fighting from them as well. Um, it, I think one of the things making all Black Lives Matter um, is, is, is like been popularized now 
as a, as a rallying cry to say like in the past movement had the tendency to be predominantly male, predominantly uh, cis male and, and heterosexual male. And I think one of the things now with the younger generation of activists, um, we're seeing black and brown um, queer women, non gender non-conforming folk, trans folk leading. And one of the things we're trying to say is follow their lead, right? Follow the lead of the folks who are closest to the margin because they're always gonna be closest to solution and our solutions have to center them. But I also think like, like I said, like learning, learning so much from past generations, there's so much to learn about how to build movement, but also how to sustain movement. And I think like one of the things we talk about now, we're in a 50 year moment, I think, it's like 2020 moment for racial, this cry for black liberation has been harkened back to 1967, where we sell riots and protests and the same things like that. But we have to learn how to sustain movement. Um, I think Monka, who you might know, but now works at Freedom Inc. Um, in Madison says we have to turn powerful protests into powerful movement. And I think we can learn from our past generations of how they were able to, to sustain movement through building more leadership, um, so folks weren't burning out. And so that's something we're trying to build off and, and learn a lot and do in this moment as well. Those are uh, great, great thoughts. Uh, it's super important to get the intergenerational pieces um, going just because it's the collective inclusive process that has the best results. Um, and uh, I know for me, what I've always appreciated to have a lot of experience in the youth development arena is that uh, newer generations have different experience, yeah. which means by default, they're going to have different needs and different solutions. And sometimes we battle with that, right? Because, you know, you, you'll hear your parents, right? How far we walked and how much we did without and all those kinds of things. But there's a reality to that, that those who are closest to it have a different experience and different process and therefore different solutions. And that's what keeps it all fresh, right? Um, also, sustainability. One lesson that I've learned is that I didn't realize when I first became organizing is it takes decades. Yeah. And that's like really hard to swallow. It takes decades. Things are speeding up faster now, is what I see. Um, and it, ha it has to be because of the digital world and the information um, that's going. Uh, Devin. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the African American Roundtable in general. Let's talk about what's the what's the board, what's the staff, what's the mission. Like, just let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. When, did, when did ART launch? Do you remember? Yeah. So I think um, so. The, the the story goes. I think the African American Roundtable was just um, was launched. It was bouncing around. It was just a collection of folks. Um, Black folks who, who worked in nonprofits um, bounced around for a few years. And in 2017, that's when Marquesa Tucker uh, became the director of the roundtable. And I think one of the things Marquesa has been able to do is to be able to elevate the work and say, like, right, there's enough problems and needs within Milwaukee that Black people have that the roundtable can own its own bucket of work. And I think that's how we got into police accountability work. And it's evolving into more and more. Um, really critiquing or not really critiquing of uh, the institution itself and trying to look past the institution of policing. Um, and with that, we've grown for a while. It was just Marquesa. And then mm -hmm. it was, for a while it was Marquesa and me. Yeah. And now it's Marquesa, myself, and Leah, who's our wonderful digital organizer. And so that's allowed us to grow our reach um, as like Tammy's acknowledged, like this world is, is becoming increasingly digital. Um, and really our focus of work is like our big campaign, the Liberate MKE campaign, which I like highlighted, which is really talking about like, what does true safety look like? How can we fund that? And, and what does a shrinking uh, law enforcement budget mean for us? And then we're always talking and we're always like placing voting and just year round civic engagement in that conversation as well. And I think Leah's taken over more of that work, which is super exciting and cool to see. But we know it's going to take multi-pronged efforts. We know it's going to take interventions in multiple systems and the multiple arenas for Black folk to be free. And so that's what we're really trying to do is, is, is interject ourselves into like right the city budget process, interject ourselves into to voting, because we know in order for us to be free, it's going to take multiple tactics. 
It's going to take multiple tactics and it's going to be a long, it's going to be a long journey. One of the things like I ask myself and one of the things that grounds me in this moment and these, all these moments is I just keep thinking about like, man, when we win, it's going to be spectacular. And that vision, <laughs> when we win, I'm, I'm visioning it right now. And one of the things, I just hope I'm not raggedy, old and raggedy when it happens, but when we win, it's going to be spectacular. <laughs> and so just doing the work so we can win and I can like, we all can like see that it's an extraordinary moment um, when we're all free. Now, um, so you know about the near south side, our population is 70% Latino, 20% white, and 8% African American, and folks don't know that about the near south side, even though, you know, metropolitan Milwaukee has the disgrace of being often the most segregated metropolitan area in the nation, and once in a while we'll dip to number two. Um, that's not true for the South Side. So we have the most racially, ethnically diverse population in the state in that piece of land. And so folks, we want to embrace African-American uh, brothers and sisters on the South Side and take up um, the cause because it's true. If, you know, if one group is being oppressed, none of us are free. Um, but we um, also have our Afro-Latino um, heritage. And that's just uh, getting, it seems like, a new... Um, attention in our own community and interracial, um, internalized racism, et cetera. Like there's a new awakening uh, to some groups, um, right? I happen to be Puerto Rican. And so my, my father is a, was a black Puerto Rican and my mother would be classified a white uh, Puerto Rican. And, and the three of us are in different scales of color. Uh, but we're just, uh, I appreciate what I never heard when I was young, the examination of internalized racism. And, um, Afro-Latinos, and then uh, just the, the brotherhood sister that we have with other communities. Uh, Devin, if folks want to get involved with you, where should they call? How should they contact you? Um, let's talk about that. Let's give folks information, and I'll make sure that the staff puts it in the comments. Yeah, so first, one of the things, um, we have our Liberate MKE um, website, and one of the things we just launched on there is a resource tab because we know we're introducing new ideas and new concepts of safety to our community. And we're asking folks to vision past this world we're living in, right? And see something different. So we have a resource tab there. So we go to www.liberatemke.com um, and you'll see the resource tab, click there. It has a lot of resources from like different events we've had, but also resources from folks who've written a lot about this topic at hand. Um, so that's a fun place to start. You can explore all the different things. It's like videos and podcasts and also articles as well. We also, you can also email me um, at Devin, D-E-V-I-N, at wisconsinvoices.org. Um, so those just are a couple ways you can stay connected. And follow us on Facebook. It's the African American Civic Engagement Roundtable page. Follow us on Facebook and you can stay connected to all of our work. Right. And is there any cost, Devin, to the resources you have or the programming that you do? Is there any cost for residents? No, no cost at all. It's all up there. Um, it's all up there. It's all free. Um, it's about engaging our residents and community as well. So no cost at all. Listen, I appreciate your time um, carving it out during this very, very um, heavy time, very busy time but we appreciate you. Also, I want to give a little shout out. When we were first starting the forum and we were terrified folks, okay? Especially me, because I'm not of this age, okay? And so the first mini training that we got was from Devin. Do you remember, Devin, that you did a little <laughs> tutorial for us just to get us like comfortable with it? That, that I was just reminded of that. Yeah, well, you know what I say? Um, yeah, I've given a lot of those mini tutorials and it's like, we've had to learn so much so quickly, but you know what I say is just like, SOC, Southside Organizing Center has like taken it way beyond um, just the production value and all y'all are able to do and all the incredible guests y'all have had over the, what, last few months now um, have been incredible and great, a great resource for everyone. So we want to thank you and then you, you like, you know, are part of that heritage for us. You're part of like, you gave us our fa first Facebook Live 
tutorial and now we're headed to a hundred episodes yes. and you had a part in that brother we appreciate you thank you thank you so much <laughs> listen be safe and we have a lot of work before us to do together um and in the arena that that we're in sounds good thank you all right adios All right, that was really informative info and I'm really glad that Devin was able to come on the forum. Um, so right now I'm going to introduce Jeanette Kowalik, uh, our commissioner of, for the, of the public health department. She's gonna come on and she's gonna give us some COVID-19 updates and we're gonna have some important discussions um, regarding you know schools opening up and other info. Uh, hello, Jeanette. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Awesome. Okay. I love the glasses, by the way. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so my first question for you is, um, how will schools approach COVID-19? What regulations is the public health department putting in place for schools that might open uh, differently, such as are charter schools opening differently? Are, um, you know, is there a process or procedure for opening up? Yes. So every school um, is required to submit a plan, and the health department reviews the plan, and we pretty much bless it. The reason for that is we know every school, uh, aside from MPS, because we've already consulted with them on their plan, mm -hmm. is uh, unique. So they have specific. Uh, student population, the way the building is laid out, or if they have multiple buildings on their campus. So we, we know that you can't just assign like one approach and it'll cover all schools. The plan enables each school to have um, something exclusive to them, if that makes sense. Mm, okay. So the plans are required to have three different levels of instruction. So the first is virtual, which is what most schools have been doing. The second is hybrid. So hybrid is a combination of virtual and in-person. It might be something like they only have class in person two times a week and it's only for four hours and then the rest is virtual um, or they're switching classes out so that they don't have everyone in at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that our moving Milwaukee forward safely order has a capacity limit of 50%. So uh, say if the school has a thousand students, they can't have more than 500 at one time. And then uh, the uh, last is full reopening. So eventually that will happen one day, right? Like we'll get to like everyone, uh, we'll move beyond all of these virtual convenings and we'll be back to doing a lot of things in person. Maybe, maybe not, but we won't have to do it because of a virus. It would be, you know, whether we decide to do it or not. You know, the weather is not that great here, especially in the winter time. So now we have some you know, um, tools and strategies to still get things done. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, the school plans, again, will be required to uh, submit and be approved by the health department. And then they include those three levels of instruction. And the reason for that is they need to be able to move back and forth between the three different levels, depending on what's going on. For instance, if they have an outbreak or if our community spread goes in the wrong direction again. As of today, our positivity rate is still about 7%. It's like 7.2 or 7.4, which is good because it was like getting up to 10 and now it's going down. So we can say that this is associated with the mask ordinance and more people embracing wearing masks as our new normal. So, um, you know, we're going to continue to lower. Um, once the positivity gets under five, then we'll hit green for that indicator, uh, which will allow uh, more things to open up. So, you know, just want to encourage everybody to um, keep wearing your mask if you're able to do so, uh, limit gatherings, you know, distancing six feet from other people. It's nice outside, do things outside. Uh, indoors is still not necessarily safe. So um, we wanna just promote that. But one thing I also wanna highlight with schools is 
what happens uh, when they have an outbreak. So this has been something a lot of um, parents and teachers have been really concerned about. Uh, and we're looking at it in three ways. Uh, this is based off of how we treat businesses now. So if there is an outbreak, it's defined as two or more cases. And that was what the state had came up with months ago. Uh, so this is for non-healthcare facilities. So um, that's important for us to distinguish. So the first level is um, any case occurring in a, a school setting in the city of Milwaukee, they have to report to the health department. Um, they're gonna receive additional uh, strategies and, and advice from our staff. Uh, and every school with an approved plan has to designate who their COVID coordinator is. And that person is like the gatekeeper or the liaison between the health department and the school. So if there's more than one case, so the two cases, then we start looking at um, like a various um, cohorts or grades having to kind of dial back to virtual so we can get to the bottom of where the source of the outbreak is and try to snuff it out. So there'll be an on-site assessment uh, to look at how can we, you know, snuff out the chain of transmission. Uh, we also look at where the source is. So say it's like the second graders and Miss K's class or something like that, then we can um, control it there versus it spreading and um, spreading out to the whole school. That's going to require some like deep cleaning of the space, you know, uh, monitoring for symptoms, testing, things like that. Uh, and then there's a 14 day uh, quarantine period for those that were in the um you know, that were directly exposed to that uh, that student or staff member. And then if we happen to have more than that, so we're looking at any positivity rate that's over three in the school facility, they're going to have to move back to virtual and do a 14-day quarantine requiring deep cleaning of any of the school spaces. And then we would, we would um, consult and monitor them in reopening. So that's what we came up with right now, because remember we were waiting for the state to issue this specific guidance and they still haven't done that yet. Right. So we basically looked at whatever the latest information we had and we made this decision at this point in time because we know some schools are set to open up like now. So we yeah. couldn't wait, keep waiting and then it's Labor Day, you know, like we had to put something together. Right. And are some of those the, the, the Milwaukee Health Department, does it overlook like Greenfield schools or Greenfield has their own public health department? They do their own thing. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So I know we get um, some confusion there. So even though Greenfield is a part of Milwaukee County, they're not in the city of Milwaukee. They're their own city. Right. So this uh, guidance or layout of what needs to happen is just for the city of Milwaukee. So any school that is in the city limit. For Milwaukee. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. That gives uh, everybody a great outlook and like outline of what would happen in case a case does arise. But um, MPS schools are virtual right now until things start to get like look better. But um, of course, uh, Jeanette Koala just was informing us about what charter schools would be going through that are reopening. Mm -hmm. um, and some have decided that they want to stay virtual for a while, and we totally support that. This was just giving schools a flexibility by submitting a comprehensive plan right. and having it, you know, like a lot of places don't have the resources to have someone consult on COVID uh, mitigation. So essentially we're providing a very valuable service to our community, um, which is, could be thousands of dollars in consulting fee that we're saving people. So I understand sometimes there's some frustration, like people want their results or their plans turn around in the day. And we're like, we've added more staff to be able to do that, but we also are providing this for free. And someone could say, well, that's my tax dollars, which is true, but we are still providing it for free. So um, we definitely want people to understand that we're doing our best and we want to make sure it's done right. And we're not trying to just slap through and pass things along. Right. That makes complete sense. Um, so my next question for you was, 
you went over masks and how it, it's gonna, wearing your mask can decrease the spread of COVID-19 and slowly get us out of the pandemic. Is there a expected uh, timeline regard, like I know we have the phases of like phase four, the next one would be phase five. Um, is there like steps uh, uh, that, you know, besides the mask ordinance that we would be implementing in the near future? Mm -hmm. So we're still under orders in the city of Milwaukee. So moving Milwaukee forward safely, we're in 4.1 right now. <laughs> and so normally it's like order number one, order number two, order number three, four, five. Order number one was the safe at home was basically, you know, you only go out for essential services. Right. So now that we're in 4.1, that's a, a lot of progress. We've allowed many um, sectors to reopen. Um, the other point about 4.1 is that we have added the um, Milwaukee Cares mask ordinance as a requirement. We also added the school element that schools are allowed to submit plans. And we also added a requirement for bars and restaurants to submit a COVID safety plan by September 15th. So we just want to encourage everyone, if you own a bar or a restaurant, get your plan in now so you're not waiting until the 15th to submit your plan like a ta like tax day. And then you, you're sitting in this like log jam because I'm assuming that we still are gonna get a lot of people that wait until the final day to submit theirs. Uh, it's essentially um, our uh, consumer environmental health email address, uh, which is cehadmin at milwaukee.gov. And there's a checklist template on our website, which is milwaukee.gov slash MMFS, which stands for Moving Milwaukee Forward Safely. And you just essentially work through this checklist for your specific business. Um, and if you happen to own multiple businesses, then you can submit, and then it could be for more than one at the same time, considering that they have a similar function and layout. Uh, just encouraging people, don't wait till the last minute, try to get yours done now, get approved so you don't have to worry about it. And you'll start seeing these placards. Um, we have like this brand for COVID stuff where it's like slime green and uh, navy blue. So it'll say like COVID safe um, approved or something like that. Uh, so you'll start seeing those along with the food grading cards. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of public places and restaurants. Um, I have a quick question for you. Can individuals who own those small businesses uh, reject cert like reject customers from coming into their facility, especially if they have signs saying, you know, if you wanna come in, you have to be wearing a mask? Yes, so we had to ask the city attorney about that because you think about like the signs you know, no, no pets, no shoes, no shirt, no service. It's the same. They, the um, business owners, many of them came together to support the mask ordinance for that very reason. They wanted a law to support their ability to tell customers that you need to wear a mask to come into our shop. But we also said like good business practice is you should also have masks available for people that may not have access to them. So don't just put the responsibility on access to a mask to the a patron or client, put it on you and them. So some people will have masks and then other people may not. And then you can offer them to them for free or maybe for something very nominal, like 50 cents or a dollar like Menards does. Right. Okay. That's a really great clarification because a lot of business owners have been having lots of questions about this. Mm -hmm. And we've only issued citations to one business because they have been violating the order mm -hmm. for the ordinance. So, um, so yeah, that one was just a variety of complaints and we had evidence, mm -hmm. like they had stuff on Facebook or something. And we're like, that's all we need. Just so everybody knows when it comes to violations for um, restaurants and bars, aside from COVID, if we have footage that's date and time stamp, we can still use that to issue um, uh, citations or fines to businesses that are non-compliant. 
So like dirty dining, like you'll see people that'll go to the gas station or something and they're like, look at the bathroom, look at this, you know, yeah. like we do take, we are able to use that evidence as long as it has a date and a timestamp. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Technology. Yeah, right. <laughs> you guys can catch anyone. <laughs> right. But you know, I, it holds people accountable too because uh, yeah. it's very you can't be everywhere. I mean, all the food inspectors, they have zones. Mm -hmm. So they have their regular rotations of how they visit businesses. But anything in between, whether it's a complaint or um, someone sending videos or pictures, like we do follow up on that. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's that. <laughs> But we also are giving out the masks to the um, distribution plan that we're required to um, submit is almost final. We sent it to the alders last week and they provided feedback by Tuesday. So it's just being finalized now. So it's mainly a lot of city entities where people can get the free masks. Um, our goal is to bring in between um, eight to 20,000 masks a week. Uh, and like I had the health department branded ones, like they're um, going to be made available throughout the city. And then we have a number of um, community-based organizations that are also uh, listed where people can access masks. And we also on our website, I think it's marquee.gov slash masks. It's going to show like little icons where you can access masks throughout the area. So you just click on the icon and it'll give you the address. and um, contact information for that site. So that's being finalized now. So I would say maybe give it a week uh, and you should be able to see where you can get free math. Okay, awesome. And then we can have um, uh, Claire Evers kind of give us an update on that when she comes on next week. Um, yeah. but she's on vacation next week. Oh, she is? Yes. Well, I mean, if you want to come on, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so my last, our last topic that we want to discuss for today is um, a person election, in person elections. So, what will in person elections look like with COVID 19, and what uh, types of protection should individuals take when going to in person voting? So, um, the election this past Tuesday definitely was not like the spring election, you know. The difference for was related to a couple of things. One, in April, uh, we had to consolidate polling sites because we didn't have enough polling workers. So we had like 170 or 80 and had to go down to five. And we definitely don't want to do that again. Right. So this time we were able to get enough people on board and get them trained so that we didn't have to do that this time around. So most of the polling sites were still open. And then we also had a number of people that use the absentee ballot process um, instead of voting in person, which also like, kind of alleviates the lines. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually did an absentee ballot, but I didn't mail it out in time. And I live downtown. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to drop it off down at the municipal building. But I didn't fill it out yet. Like I just was like, oh, I'm just going to like see what they say because I didn't know. I'm like old school. I like to vote in person. So I went to the polling site and they had, it was like on point. They had the plexiglass, everyone was wearing masks, everything was spaced out. Um, you know, you use your own pen, like they give you a pen, you don't give it back, no stickers, anything like that. And then they had like tons of like sanitizer and wipes and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, instead of handing in an absentee ballot in the envelope, I would have had to go to the election commission office, which is at City Hall on the fifth floor, or I would have had to go to their warehouse, which was like on Connecticut. So I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm just going to like it's give them the ballot like I'm just voting now. And so that's what you do. If you do have an absentee ballot and you haven't mailed it out by election day, just take it to your normal polling site and then they're going to make you actually enter it into the machine. Right. So, so just so everybody knows, don't just like, the, oh, well, I'm just not going to vote. No, please go vote. <laughs> don't yeah. risk it. So that's my thing for November. Like, try to be um, proactive, plan way in advance. And we will continue to have precautions uh, on point so that uh, we're limiting exposure to COVID-19 for people that are going to vote in person in November. My thing is, and I was on WPR this morning, 
is that November is going to be tricky because you know how the weather is in Wisconsin. Right. If there's lines and there will be lines, you're looking at, okay, is it going to be a fair day? Like maybe in the fifties, like, so if you're standing outside for hours, you're not like being exposed to the cold and elements. But if it's like really cold and like snowy or something like that, that definitely will be an impact. So yeah. let's like light some candles and do what we got to do to have good weather in November. <laughs> right. And yeah, that's the importance of absentee ballots. You don't really have to leave your house. Huh? Um, right. Just do it early though. Don't wait yeah. till the day. Like yeah. I do. <laughs> Uh, well, I have a quick, nice comment here from Tammy Rivera. She's saying, Dr. Kowalik, once again, congratulations for your reappointment as our health commissioner. We still appreciate your partnership. Thank you, Tammy. You're the best. I appreciate your support, too. I saw your note. Uh, we have lots of uh, comments, uh, people saying hello, uh, mainly saying hello. If you got any questions, please post them. We can get... Uh, Commissioner Kowalik to answer them for you. Um, I can send them through email if you have any questions for her. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jeanette, um, or Commissioner Kowalik, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, we appreciate you and your time and for explaining all of these important topics for us today. Thank you for having me. Have a yeah. good weekend. Thanks. You too. Thanks. All right, folks. So uh, we have a guest waiting for us, actually. Um, I have um, um, Maduela Kirkendall. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he is the chief operating officer of the Community Advocates. Um, so the critical topic we're going to talk about today is energy assistance and eviction resources from Community Advocates. So first of all, um, uh, Maduela, can you can you tell us about your role and community advocates' role in the community and their mission? Sure, um, I'm currently the chief operating officer for Community Advocates. Um, I've been here for 21 years. Uh, started here in the housing field, actually, as a housing advocate. Um, and, and community advocates' role in the community is to provide individuals and families with services and advocacy, um, so that they may meet their basic needs. Um, and live in dignity. Uh, our work is primarily rooted around ensuring in individuals have safe and stable housing, um, but we also provide a wide array of services in the areas of, um, again, as we, we're going to talk about today, energy assistance, housing assistance, um, domestic violence services, substance use disorder uh, services, as well as mental health services. Um, and uh, the other thing, I, we also provide services around uh, issues that involve men, so such as child support, arrearages, uh, domestic violence, uh, prevention, and things of that nature as well. And that's amazing. Uh, so can you talk to us about uh, what energy energy assistance services are offered through people? Sure. sure. Um, first, I'd like to just kind of clarify that. So the Department of Administration is in the state of Wisconsin, uh, is administers, is in charge of the funding for that program. Um, specifically under Decker, which is Department of Housing, um, Energy, and Community Resources. And they contract with Milwaukee County to provide those services, um, Department of Health and Human Services, Milwaukee County. And then they fund two organizations to provide energy assistance, Community Advocates being one and UMOS being the other. And essentially, energy assistance provides a one-time payment for families that meet the income guidelines, which is fairly high, 60% of state uh, median income. Uh, and it's a one-time payment that may go directly to uh, the heating company, which would be Wind Energies in this particular case. If individuals have heat included in their bill, they actually receive a check themselves. Okay. And how long does this last? This is an annual thing. It lasts all year. Mm -hmm. So energy assistance is a program that lasts. It starts um, October 1st and it lasts through September 30th. In the past, the actual energy assistance one-time benefit, that portion of the program where there's a payment made only lasted through May 15th. However, due to COVID and other things, um, we've extended, the state has allowed us to extend it so that you can actually receive a benefit 12 months out of the year. So this current program year actually goes through September 30th. So okay. most people, this is the first time since I've been doing this in the 20 plus years I've been around, 
um, that this has ever happened. So just encouraging individuals to um, come into the office. Well, I'm sorry, not come in, but actually call, make an appointment so we can get them um, processed and get a benefit towards their heating cost. Can you give us the direct line for um, community advocates? Sure. So if an individual is looking to make an appointment or talk to someone, there's a centralized which is 414-270-4653. Easy way to remember it is 414-270-4MKE. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and so what, what can you talk to us about evictions? There's been evictions happening recently and uh, what resources can you provide for those that are currently facing those evictions? Yeah, yeah good question. So currently there, there are a number of resources that are available. We've always provided some form of rental assistance or rental arrear assistance. Um, with COVID and the CARES Act, we've expanded our services. We actually are working uh, closely with Milwaukee County who is funding um, our the largest portions of our rental assistance program. Um, and we are able to provide individuals with arrearages um, in the amount up to you know three thousand dollars and in some cases five thousand dollars if they have experienced a loss due to COVID specifically. Okay. And so we, we made the process fairly simple for that. Individuals can go to our website communityadvocates.net or they can go to um, rent help at communityadvocates.net and apply online as well as coming to our office and we've opened up our lobby area so that individuals can come in and get assistance if they're not tech savvy. And we have several staff down there that will assist them with filling out paperwork, making copies of necessary documentation, um, and, and getting the ball rolling for those individuals to ensure that they are safe and stable in their homes. Wow, that's a very important resource to have right now for our community. And I advocate for those that do need help to reach out. Um, it takes one phone call. Just yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we again, we've made the process as simple as possible for individuals. And I think. Um, again, the, the key with that is just making sure there's communication. We always encourage tenants, if you're experiencing um, you know, a, a challenge with your rent, mm -hmm. to communicate with your landlord. That's very important. But also, once you do that, communicate with community advocates. And we will work with both the tenant and the landlord so that the landlord is aware that we are in the process of working with them to get them their funding. Awesome. That's amazing. Uh, is there a cost for this type of service? There is no cost at all. We provide everything free of charge. Um, yeah, we, we've never charged a fee for these services. So we understand there's a need and there shouldn't be a fee uh, mm -hmm. for those individuals that are in need. Mm -hmm. And due to the CARES Act, you guys have received a nice amount of um, grant money in order to help uh, the south side of Milwaukee. Yep, so we, we received roughly $6 million from Milwaukee County provide assistance. And there was a re recent press release, I think today, um, that city of Milwaukee is actually kicking in some additional money. I think it's um, $1.6 million um, to also provide assistance. And then we also are working closely with our partner organization, STC. They also provide uh, the RAP funding, which is similar to what we provide, in addition to um, the funding that the city of Milwaukee will be providing to them in the near future. So both organizations are working closely um, to ensure that you know the families and individuals in Milwaukee County are not experiencing homelessness. homelessness you know, in addition to facing the challenges that COVID um, presents to us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, um, one last question real quick. Uh, there are language services available? Correct. So we, we have got our way to a hire of individuals that are um, um, bilingual in ser ser several areas. And then we also have bilingual services that we contract with if we don't have that expertise in-house. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, Adwella. Uh, we'd love to have you on again um, in the next coming weeks, and we appreciate you and your time. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, right, everyone. Um, so now I'm gonna we're gonna play our daily survey. Has this live forum been informative and useful to you? What part of the forum could be improved or changed to make it better? Please take a quick survey that's located in the comments section so that we can keep 3 o'clock with SAC going for residents. Thank you for tuning in. All right, that was our daily survey. Please um, fill that out for us whenever you get a chance to. 
Uh, so just some reminders for anything coming up for the week. Tomorrow, we are having Dakota Hall from Lit coming on our forum. And we are starting our new format for our segment for next week. So we're going to have design designated days for each day. Uh, Monday being civic, Tuesday being youth, Wednesday being Spanish with Tammy, Thursday being COVID-19, and Friday being everything about organizing leadership and community development. Um, and again, our topic for this week has been um, a new, the new generation of organizers, and we also went over Get Out the Vote um, the past few days. And uh, i just like to say that SOC is in solidarity with protesters and families of protesters. Uh, we hold our thoughts and prayers with those impacted by COVID-19, especially those that are ill due to COVID-19 and those who have experienced any deaths in their families and deaths of friends uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, and now we'd like to play a partner uh, video for you guys with some thank yous. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you for coming on to watch today. Hello, Xaviers. I am Esperanza Gutierrez, a longtime resident of the near South Side. We would like to thank everyone for supporting our three o'clock with SAC live show and for completing our SAC survey. In addition to thanking our residents for turning in and sharing our show, we would also like to thank the following sponsors, Wisconsin Voices, Community Development Block Grant, Neo Philanthropy State Infrastructural Fund, the Movement Voter Project, the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, the Silver Foundation, City of Milwaukee Office of Violent Prevention, the Tithe Foundation, the City of Milwaukee Promise Zone, and all the faithful individuals who support SAC through their personal donations. Thank you. Gracias.